Microsoft partners with Ping. CyberArk gets a new patent. Yet even more behavior-based endpoint protection. Intel sells McAfee teaming up with MSPs and embracing change in the cloud on this edition of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. Pro TV, an easy, entertaining approach to online IT training. IT Pro TV offers 1,000 hours of up-to-date, high-quality video training content. Course topics include certified cloud security professional, ethical hacking, cryptography, and VMware. You can stream their courses live or on demand to your mobile device, all for one low monthly subscription price and cancel at any time. Visit itpro.tv forward slash enterprise security to upgrade your brain with the most popular IT certifications. Use the code ES30 for a free seven day trial and save 30% off for life. Welcome everyone to Enterprise Security Weekly. We're broadcasting live from G Unit Studios in Rhode Island. I'm, of course, your host, Paul Asadorian, joined on the lines via Skype by none other than Mr. John Strand. John, welcome to the show. Hello, happy to be back. I heard you had some good people sitting in for me while I was out. I did, yes. We, uh, we had a little party while you were away, and uh, it was good. We got some good feedback on it. And we've got another party this week, John, and I'm glad that you are able to partake in it. To my right, live here in studio, is Matt Alderman. You're still the Vice President of Strategy for Tenable Network Security, correct? I am, yes. Okay, Thank just you. make sure your title didn't change. Yeah, yet. and so it's not only when you're gone, John, I'm, I'm even going to be here while you're here. So yeah. I'll have <laughs> wow. a little more fun today. There you go. <laughs> Matt, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you. You were in the area. And yeah. I was like, dude, you got to come on Enterprise. I, it's been, yeah, it's been like a year. <laughs> since I think I've been in the studio. So many changes yeah, here. There's it's, been a lot of looks, changes. It looks great. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Ian Myers on the lines via Skype. Ian, welcome. Well, thank you for having me. I'm a uh, real pleasure to be here. It's kind of funny. I, I think it's going to be very encouraging for our listeners to hear how Ian ended up on the show. We ended up talking about one of Ian's articles that he wrote for Tripwire State of Security blog. And John and I didn't necessarily agree with all of the points in it. And Ian sent us email, and we're like, dude, like, you should come on the show, because like, we totally need to have a discussion about this, and uh, it's going to be fun. So Ian, I want to thank you very much uh, again for, for joining us today. No, thank you. Thank you very much. So see, even if usually John doesn't agree with something, you can email us, and we'll just bring you on the show and have an adult discussion about it. Not adult like, like Triple X adult, Ian. That's maybe for the other show. Um, I will put my pants back on. Yeah. <laughs> no, not necessary. Um, so, <laughs> kicking off the enterprise security news, Hack Naked's our other show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, Microsoft is partnering with Ping, Ping's identity access product, uh, Ping Access, uh, which is designed to manage and access non standards based legacy applications, will be integrated into Azure. 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 Um, Azure Active Directory Application Proxy. Um, basically, uh, it says examples of web apps that don't use standard authentication protocols like OAuth or Kerberos are ones that, or are ones that use HTTP header or cookie-based authentication, which is the problem. I tend to think that the problem with legacy-based applications is not authentication and authorization. It's the fact that they still run Windows 2000. But or XP. Or XP. Or 95. Or yeah, yeah, exactly. Pick your <laughs> old operating system of choice. So discuss that that point. Do you agree? Is it, 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 I, I read this and I was like, that's like, are you solving a problem? Like, you're not solving the right problem, in my opinion. You're, you're allowing the behavior to continue. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All you've done is but created a crutch for everybody to continue to do it wrong. This One is of the problems, though, with, with a lot of this, however, is there's a number of customers that we deal with that actually can't. Um, and I think they should, but they, they say they can't. For example, um, we had a couple of banks this year that were using AS400s. Uh, we have 
some DOD customers that are using Solaris 8 and 9 systems and password complexity, especially with Solaris 8, is no more than eight characters. So you have a lot of these quote unquote legacy applications and some of them are like 20, 30 million lines of code. And the idea of completely refactoring that is, is abhorrent to a lot of these organizations. So this works as a really nice band-aid for that. And I agree that we're kind of enabling bad behavior but at the exact same time, there's a huge market there. And whenever we're talking about what this kind of show focuses on, um, Ping Identity is a company I've done work with in the past. Um, I have a number of customers that use them, and they do a great job at kind of stitching together this archaic crap and making it work. So um, Ping is so on your nice list. John, John has like the naughty and nice list of vendors. Yeah. Well, they're, they're Ping, you're lucky. You're on John's nice well, list. Well, they're headquartered downtown Denver, there you so go. There I'm a Colorado yeah. guy, yeah. so it's actually, always good to have a good Colorado how, company Matt, on this how did list. you know that? Yeah, I actually went down to their headquarters years ago, and it's a beautiful building right downtown off the 15th Street Mall. Yeah, I and, said, uh, But every time I've worked with them, they tend to be more expensive hourly, but they tend to get things done much faster than any of their competitors. They're very, very, very competent. So yeah, they're definitely on my nice list. Yeah, I, I sat with their CEO at RSA um, at the speaker dinner. We were both speakers, and I didn't realize they were Denver, actually, when, when I sat down next to them. Ooh. I had no idea, and I was like, wait, you're in Denver? He's like, yeah, you got to come down. We should, we should talk. And then they got bought by the private equity firm, mm -hmm. um, and so they've been going through that transition. So I haven't actually spent a lot of time with them, but I know they are headquartered downtown Denver. Cool. Yep. Yeah. Um, CyberArk receives a patent for detecting cybersecurity risks. The patent for correlation-based security risk identification covers methods and systems to map risks arising from credentials, especially privileged credentials present on machines in the network once compromised enable attackers to compromise other machines in the network. I think it's kind of an interesting patent. I also find it interesting how much tied to security cyber arc is, whereas you kind of think about privileged identity management as, you know, just managing, managing people, right? Managing people. Managing people it, and who they have access to. But there's a, a lot of these vendors now are doing analytics. And I, I kind of picked on cyber arc, I think last week and said, well, they're getting so big that they're not innovating and some of the other players are catching up to them in the market. With this patent, it certainly sounds like they're being innovative. So they proved me wrong, which it happens every now and again. Well, or not. Well, well but the, a patent doesn't necessarily mean innovation. I right? know. Yeah. In, in, in the terms a little loaded, cyber risks, right? We, we in the security industry like to mm. talk about risk, but we truly don't understand risk that well because risk is much broader than just security vulnerabilities or security issues, right? Risk, mm -hmm. risk has business implications and business impact and other things. So I'd be curious to really understand how they're tying um, some of the identity stuff back into business context. Mm -hmm. Could they actually do some very interesting um, understanding of risks? But we use it a lot as is, is an industry. It's, mm -hmm. It gets a little dangerous. I don't like to use that term very often. Having well, come from the GRC space, I, I have a little broader yeah. um, understanding of what risk really is. Um, but yes, you know, they, CyberArk in general has done very well capturing the market, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people want to be like CyberArk when they're a public company, which is pretty interesting. Well, um, they have a very clean balance sheet. They, yeah, they've they run a tight ship it, over there at CyberArk is what I was reading in, in articles in the right. past couple of weeks. So. And so a lot of people like go to them, they flock to them, they really want to use CyberArk. And so they've done very, very well as and a you company. you want to partner with them, Tenable? Yeah, we actually, a, yeah, we're actually right, integrated yeah. with the CyberArk vault for yep. credentials, right? So the scanner will go yeah. authenticate to the vault, pull out the credentials for scanning, use those, and then when they're done, those credentials go away. So mm -hmm. it's better than storing them in our interface for those customers that have CyberArk. So we partner with them very, very well. Mm -hmm. um, but I've kind of viewed them as kind of that, that was it, right? Privilege access yeah, management. That's what if I they are too. starting to actually move out of that space, that's actually pretty interesting, and that's good. Yeah. Analytics will drive the future of, of our space. So. Yep. Well, and we've seen other analytics vendors partner with uh, the identity management vendors, and they're doing the analytics. So they'll suck in right. from. Yeah. And so we see the other way. That's why I thought it was interesting that CyberArk sounds like it's doing trying it, to do that. Doing and, it and, that's, and that's what a lot of companies in the security space are trying to do, right? Bring in other people's data, contextualize yeah. that, be the analytics interface. Everybody wants their customers to be in their interface. Mm -hmm. They don't want their data to go somewhere else. This is a way for CyberArk to try to get more people to stay in the CyberArk right. interface. Uh, John, and this go ahead. one. Yeah, this one's also going to be interesting um, because there was a tool that was released at um, Black Hat Arsenal this year called Bloodhound, which does this. I actually went through and read 
the patent before we actually got on uh, the show today. And basically, let's, let's set up a, some context and kind of talk about what they're discussing. So let's say I'm logged into a machine, right? I've, I've exploited one computer system, and I'm local administrator on that computer. Now, however I got local administrator is up for different questions, but let's just assume that I am a local administrator on that computer system. What you can do at that point is you can query the domain controller, and you can try to identify if there is any other systems on the network that the quote unquote users group or my user ID, whatever token it is I'm using logged into that domain, is in the administrator's group on that workstation. So an example would be help desk is trying to set up a computer, an application's not running. So what they do is they go to the local administrator's group and they add in domain users as local administrators on that system. So the tool Bloodhound does this. It actually go through and find those systems where your user account that you have is a administrator on that computer system, and in the then it'll local, tie to, in the local group, in the local context yep, of the system. In the local context, but here's where it gets interesting. It'll then see who else is logged into that workstation and see what their permissions are. So if I, as a user, I can log into that system as a local administrator, and then logged into that system as a domain administrator, I can then steal that domain administrator's token. It's kind of a complicated dance, and it requires pretty heavy analytics and visualization. And t the tool is Bloodhound. It was released at Arsenal. Um, and what it does is you run it on your environment, and it'll see what is your quickest path to becoming a domain administrator by jumping from your workstation to another workstation that you have local administrator access, and then taking the domain administrator token and then elevating your privileges that way. And that's just kind of one path but that they're it actually it sounds like watching. this could be a defensive tool. I, as a, if Absolutely. I were the administrator, I'd want to run this. Absolutely. And that gets into why this is, I think this is neat. It's not just a tool that's used for pen testers to gain access to becoming a domain administrator. But what they're doing is they're actually looking at the environment and they're looking for those pathways. Mm -hmm. And then they're trying to close those pathways off or at least alert you whenever those pathways start being used. Um, so it, it's, it's a kind of a complicated idea. But if you want to see the tool, it's called Bloodhound. And I think that this is a fantastic it's kind of a door that's opening up into the future of security. Whenever you're talking about data analytics, I'll talk about artificial intelligence and k-means clustering a little bit later. But all of that is kind of opening the door and it's showing where we're going to be in the next 10 to 20 years. And uh, agree with Matt, everybody wants to make sure that all of that kind of analytics is done in their dashboard and you're watching everything from their dashboard. And it creates a lot of interesting problems. And I think CyberArk has sidestepped a lot of those problems by basically collecting the data and housing the data and integrating with Active Directory as a single source for that type of analytics for privileged identity access management and abuse. Um, that's why I absolutely love them. And that's why their product is a very, very difficult product when implemented correctly uh, to get around in a penetration test. So it, it, as you describe what they've actually done, it, it, it's like attack path for users, right? You've seen others go down this attack path scenario of trying to understand where pinch points in the network are and try to visualize mm -hmm. that so you know where to lock it down. This is actually doing it now at the user level and, mm -hmm. and understanding how a user could potentially um, escalate privileges to um, you know, exploit other machines. So very interesting Ab concept because we're seeing it Ab elsewhere on the network side. Absolutely. And take that one step further and imagine that that risk and those pinch paths are actually dynamic and constantly changing. And you're getting a really good idea of the types of paths that attackers are using today to get to main administrator. And they're starting to watch those doors. So it's very, very cool. It actually scares me a little bit because those are some of the things that we use on a regular basis. But my job getting harder is a good thing all the way across the board. Uh, Sophos rolls out Intercept X for endpoint protection. The article states the product uses behavior-based screening to detect malicious behavior on endpoints rather than signature-based protection. Hi Sophos, welcome to the 21st century where behavior-based has long replaced signature-based technology. Yeah, That was my comment. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I mean, but really, uh, they're like... 15 years it, or more behind it, the, but, the curve. But this is where everybody's jumping into the endpoint space, right? But behavior-based is a loaded term, uh, too, it, yeah. also. Yeah, I mean, it is. you can say, I'm looking, we just talked about looking at behavior in, when we're talking about cyber arc and identifying risk, but how, it, it, it goes so much. And John, I think you started to allude to this. Like A lot of people say, yeah, we have behavior-based anomaly detection. But, but okay, mm -hmm. so what, what does that mean? Everyone has that now, but what, what, what are the differences under the covers? 
And this one I think is somewhat interesting because they're actually trying to look at the concept of what a zero day does. Uh, if you exploit an application, how does that application bypass security controls? For example, um, attacking something like structured exception handling and doing a pop-pop return off of uh, a dynamic link library with safe SGH disabled. That's something that is very unique to the way malware actually functions. Walking ntdll.dll to open up the network connections leaving that system. That is something that's unique to a lot of different types of malware. But I think, Paul, you're absolutely right. I think this is nice. I think that people are starting to look into it. Actually, that's not even true. I think you're right. A lot of vendors have been looking into this for a long time. And I, I, I'd like to get Matt's take on this whenever we're talking about agents. It seems like everybody wants to start doing this, whether or not you're a Bit9 or you're Carbon Black um, or you're CrowdStrike. What is it? Silent. CrowdStrike, I mean, Silence. Silence. I mean, I mean I think all someone said there's 40 vendors in the endpoint protection space. How, yeah. How, how, how do we deal with that? How do you deal with the endpoint just glut that's happening right now? Well, that's the problem, right? And I think that's the pushback you're starting to see in the industry. You know, when we release the agent on our side, Right, and ours doesn't do anywhere near this. It was just really get vulnerability configuration and and known malware off the box. Right, customers are like I love it, but you got to replace at least two agents before I can put another agent yeah. on. Right. So what you see is this interesting trend right now where everybody's trying to create the alternative to the antivirus agent. Right, and so you see this with Bit9 and Carm Black. You see it with CrowdStrike. You see it with Silence. All these guys are going off after the endpoint detection response market, but realize that there's still an antivirus component that mm -hmm. has to be addressed. And so now you're starting to see them come up with alternative ways to deal with the antivirus because they all want to replace the antivirus agent at the end of the day. They right. all want to uh -huh. do this. And I, I think well, a lot of people have tried to use their antivirus agent to do some of the advanced detection that like a silence does. And it never, I, I, no, customers no. don't report to me that that works out really well. Either it's usually one of two things. Some, most of the time, both they're like, it doesn't work the way that I expected. Okay, so it's three things. It doesn't work the way I expect her to detect the attacks. It's a really difficult agent to manage and configure, and they want a bazillion dollars to enable these features, and it's too, it's, the cost and is too high. It, yeah. You know, it's funny. It, I, I feel like a lot of these products, and Matt, you, you have a lot more insight to this than, than we do. It seems like a lot of these products, especially with endpoint agents, are rushed to market, and they're half-baked. I, I collect all the emails from... Um, from uh, Silence, whenever something goes wrong with Silence. And they have these, uh, you know, basically support tickets, Silence council errors would be the, uh, would be the subject. And it, they say, what's the problem? And I think I have like five of them that say the exact same thing. What's the problem? Some customers are reporting that various sections of the council are reporting error. Sorry, an error occurred while processing your request. And I have like three, four of these emails right here. And you know, a lot of these vendors will tell you, oh, no, our agents rock solid, our agents rock solid. But if you actually sit back and you look at how many different problems has their product had that they had to send an email to every single one of their customers to let them know that they're working on it, it, it starts to make you very, very uncomfortable. And like I said, I like Silence. I think Silence is a great product. But at times, it feels like the polish just isn't there. And it might actually be putting your systems at greater risk simply because it is a half-baked product. So... I don't know. What, what, what's your kind of thinking on that? Do you see that kind of concurrent problem with a lot of these agent-based solutions and the fact that it looks like they're actually rushed and they're not as polished as they should be? It, well, yeah. Well, I, I mean, there is an aspect to that, right? Because everybody's now trying to get their endpoint detection response agents out there, right? That's the really hot market for endpoint. And so you definitely are seeing a glut of these new things coming into the market. And, and part of it boils down to technology and, and the way they deploy. There are some very innovative techniques out there. Some of the stuff that CrowdStrike's doing with really trying to map uh, the different events when applications form to start to build those behavior maps and, the, and understanding that behavior stuff is very interesting. Don't get me wrong. But their agent adoption isn't as high as their threat intelligence adoption, right? They, they produce good threat intel because they have all these events and all this correlated data that really helps drive the threat intelligence stuff, which is cool. But that's almost at, at, um, um, at, at the uh, mercy of, of getting the agents deployed. Uh, then you'll see others that really struggle in certain situations because of the way they de they've deployed, right? The sandboxing techniques we know are, are not as effective mm -hmm. at the endpoint. So you see a lot of technologies based on sandboxes. There's ways around those. So how good are they really? No one's come up with a really good kernel-based agent 
to do some of this. I mean, WebSense has done some interesting stuff. I think I think over Bromium time, but got, I think Bromium's gotten the closest. But it's hard because it, there's Bromium looks at that security versus productivity trade off and like what you need to do with your computer, and they basically went hard left to security. Uh, to the point where many of our customers that are running Bromium are running it on a very small number of instances just because it's almost impossible to do work. And I know I'm going to have somebody from Bromium send me hate mail, but uh, our customers that <laughs> it's use that... It's not usually hate mail. Level. It's definitely... It's, we definitely get communications from most of the people that we yeah. mention on the show. Yeah. Just, it, uh, it's maybe. interesting. But, uh, but, but, so you, what else is but you do podcast? see... They said Silence was doing a trial with OPM right before they had the breach. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it was OPM. But oh, there was a, no. Was it OPM? Oh. I don't um, know. Yeah, um, Office of Personnel Management. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think OPM it. was trialing Silence, and then they implemented Silence, and it turns out that the claim now is that Silence could have prevented that breach. But now, who's to say if they had Bromium and had it configured in a different way that they could have or couldn't? And that's right. the point, right? Like, which agent do you choose and how you configure it? It could prevent the next breach from happening, or maybe not. Or you're so concerned about the negative impacts of rolling out an endpoint agent, as, as John has described, that you're in trial for a while, as was OPM. Well, and if you're in trial, you're only doing detection. You're not doing prevention. Mm -hmm. I mean, everybody's going to roll this stuff out in detect mode. Right. And very few are ever going to put it in a prevention mode because I don't think they trust it yet. Mm -hmm. So even if it were deployed, it could have detected it as long as their sensors and their SOC could have gotten the alerts, right? But it's highly unlikely a lot of this stuff is getting put directly into a prevention mode. Right. right? Uh, so they're not doing just any prevention. Moving on to the next story. There's been some pretty major changes. And you, you had identified, I think, three. And I think I only knew a two out of the three. So Intel sells McAfee. HP split their hardware. And, well, they sold off all their software. All their software assets, All their software yeah. assets got sold from HP, which includes security products in that yep. portfolio, uh, obviously. And th was there one other one? Those were the two big ones. The two big ones. I mean, obviously, the the RSA EMC under Dell was uh, yes. official last week, right? right so, right. Um, you know, the announcements came out from both the RSA and the EMC teams. Hey, we're now part of Dell. Nothing changes, right? That was kind of the beginning of the week right after Labor Day. And then you but got that's security company going to big company. Yeah. And then you've got Intel spinning then off Intel security. Intel spinning off security. And, and then, then you have HP spinning off security, yeah. right? So it's, yeah. you, a lot of people have kind of thought that there was going to be major consolidation in the market on the security side, right? Mm -hmm. And if you're a small startup, you're all looking to get bought, right? It, because all these guys are like, hey, I got this really cool thing. Pull me into your portfolio. But what we saw last week with Intel and HP is that they're actually divesting some of their security assets, which is kind of interesting. Um, because that's not what we were expecting. We were expecting more consolidation. We weren't really expecting divestitures mm -hmm. on, on that side. Now, there's probably reasons on both sides. Um, you know, Intel's kind of vision for what they wanted to do with McAfee was embed security on the chip. They never really implemented that. Yeah. So maybe it was the right thing from a business perspective to, to spin off McAfee and, and do what they did. It's interesting when they, who they sold it to, though. They sold it to TPG, who also is a big investor in Tanium. Oh, interesting. So think about that now. Now TPG has both Tanium and McAfee in the portfolio. Mm -hmm. Could you see something there? Maybe I don't. I don't know. But they, but they definitely have uh, an interesting portfolio with the McAfee and the in the Tanium stuff. Mm -hmm. HP, on the other hand, you know, HP first split themselves in half. Now you've got HP Enterprise taking the software assets, the Arc sites, and and some of the other software assets, selling those off. Really focusing back on the hardware side, mm -hmm. uh, the Aruba acquisition and then all the, the other HP components. Interesting, going kind of hardcore hardware. Mm -hmm. um, right decision? I, I don't know yet, but it is interesting to see some of these divestitures yeah, on I the mean, security My side. question is, is security too complex for these big companies to figure out and they're just deciding to spin it off? Well, security is complex in general, as we all know, being in the space, mm -hmm. right? The, the, I think the hope the customers would have is that they can start to consolidate and come up with a much more cohesive, comprehensive security um, set of products. Mm -hmm. This isn't helping that though. No. Because now you're, you're creating actually 
probably additional. Well, you know, and you and I differ, I think, on that things. point too. I see, I really believe that as technology grows, you're gonna see more uh, security technology and there's gonna be lots of companies to choose from and people are gonna choose the security technologies that work for them. But it now, makes it really complex to deploy, manage, operate, integrate, and get to the end result, which is a better security program. I think some customers would like to see some consolidation so they can get more out of one, but... Maybe we'll see a reconsolidation. Maybe. Well, so, but, but I, I have the question though, why is it that there's this huge push to kind of make bigger companies, right? Like for a while ago, Intel bought McAfee. You have the uh, Dell SecureWorks RSA. Um, you, you have this just massive kind of consolidation of all of these different companies. And now all of a sudden they're divesting. They're starting to kind of let all that stuff go. So what were the forces that drove it in the past to consolidate and make their portfolio have security? And now all of a sudden, I mean, we're not talking like 10, 15 years. We're talking two, three years. These companies are now divesting their security portfolio as quickly as possible. What, what, what drove that to happen in the first place to become massive monolithic security companies like Intel Security and now all of a sudden start breaking it out again? I have some theories. It's theories that I kind of use in my thinking on, on a regular basis. The cloud is changing the way we're going to think about security. And if you look at Intel and you look at HP, they're trying to figure out how they compete with the cloud providers. And, and they really are, right? If, if, if I were any large enterprise provider of hardware and stuff, you got to look at what AWS is doing to, their, to them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was explaining this yesterday. How much EMC disk is in AWS? None. How many Dell servers are sitting in AWS? I don't think there's any. I mean, there could be. But the cloud providers at the infrastructure layer are not using these large uh, technology companies anymore as part of their infrastructure. That's interesting. Right? And so I think part of it is they're trying to refocus, they're trying to hang on. But the cloud shift is going to change, I think, the way we think about security because I think security will become more embedded in those cloud infrastructures of the future because I think customers are going to demand it. When I move to cloud, you're going to secure my infrastructure. I'm buying the boxes from you. I'm buying the network. I'm buying the storage. You secure it. Then the shift, I think, and this is my belief, right, is that the shift will then move to the application, the data, and the user because those are the things corporations will be able to control and those are the areas that they're going to have to look at. And if that's playing out in what Intel and HP are doing, that's a little foreshadowing of maybe what the future looks like in a cloud infrastructure environment. So they're well, going to say, spin off McAfee, you take care of the application, the users, and the data. HP and the Intel's are going to refocus on the cloud infrastructure piece. Maybe. Yeah, and I used to disagree with Matt on that point because we've had this conversation before, Matt. I used to disagree uh, pretty vehemently because I thought the cloud was nothing more than outsourcing for this generation. And what kind of finally turned me around was if you start looking at what Amazon officer offers, they no longer, it's no longer an issue of just offering computer systems that are in the cloud. What they're in fact offering now is complete services within the cloud. You're now looking at them, they now have their databases in the cloud, right? Um, they now have their queuing engine, something like Kinesis. So you have that ingest, you have uh, whatever Amazon calls it, uh, it's uh, Lam is it Lambda? Is Lambda, it Lambda, Lambda, for doing um, functions within the cloud as well. So. I, I, what I think happened, and I think this is kind of echoing what you said, is I think if you go back three, four years ago, all these companies are saying, oh, my word, we need to get bigger. We need to start getting into the cloud. And by the time they got there, they kind of realized that the party had already happened. And Amazon was way far ahead of everybody. Um, Google was the next one in running that maybe has the funding to actually make it happening for different services that they're already doing. And Azure, maybe that's... Maybe that's Microsoft's final dying gasp to try to keep up as well. The point is, it almost looks like these vendors got to the cloud race and they realized that they were a bit too far behind. And now they're trying to divest because they know that they probably can't compete with it. Um, I don't know if that's the same approach you're looking at it. But yeah, I agree. The cloud is an absolutely completely disruptive series of technologies that will fundamentally shift everything. And unfortunately, I have a fear that we will have less and less control. Well, and I also think that in transition to our next couple of stories too is that businesses, as we've said on the show before, are still lagging behind in cloud adoption. However, we see a lot of the vendors shifting towards cloud. It, so I, I think that, you know, John talked about like a progression from big companies and dealing with Amazon, that's going to have a trickle-down effect into businesses 
that have to adopt the cloud and they're going to lag behind. And what's going to happen when they're so far behind that they can't catch up with their own IT infrastructure? Yeah, and, and you're, already, you're already starting sorry, to see it. Ian, I, did I, you have something? Yeah, no, sorry, my, my video cut out for a second, so I apologize. But yeah, um, this tying into some of the other stories and whatnot, what you're talking about is absolutely correct, but I don't think it's going to be a direction downward where enterprises, et cetera, are trying to adopt. I think what's going to happen is these startups, people that want to become a startup, that want to become an enterprise, et cetera, they're going to be born into it. They're yep. going to not accept providers that aren't giving them security. They're going to start with WAFs. They're going to start with load balancers. They're going to start with all these pieces that they would have had to wait to get their big boy pants on and go into an enterprise space. And they're going to have it from go. So I'm actually really excited from the I, other direction that it's going to age out. I disagree. Um, okay. Simply because I haven't seen it. Um, I, I, I would have agreed with you a while ago. Uh, but whenever, like, let's just use the web application firewall as an example. If you're working with something like Akamai Kona um, or any of these products, yeah, they're, they're great products. But underlying what you said, and I may have been misreading it, and if I did, I apologize. You have a tendency to do that with Ian. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but not with me anymore, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Is an yeah. assumption that these cloud providers will actually take care of that security for you. Oh, and then you are the wrong. I, I do not think that at all. No. Okay. I, 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 like I said, I might have misread it. But Just when you have customers that are looking be to there purchase these if products. they choose to use them. What's that? The tools are there if they choose to use them. Things that that startups generally didn't have access to previously. And and that's that's the point where I disagree. I believe that they've had those tools before. If they simply have the tools in the cloud and they didn't use them before, simply by virtue of being in the cloud doesn't necessarily mean the implementation of that tool is any easier. And well, I'll give you that. A, implementation like, definitely is, is the issue. You can have it and not do it right. Sure, absolutely. But, I, but what Amazon has done with things like the web application firewall, the inspector agent, they are offering more capabilities to those customers right out of the box. Mm -hmm. And... Yeah. And it's not based on a commercially viable product, right? It's it's not an imperva firewall. It's, it's not it's a, a feature right. That you get it's we, it's just there. It's mm -hmm. it's embedded. It's built in. Use it, and if you use it, so, and so you John's get the point, benefits out of it. People won't use it until there's a breach, and then they'll be like, "Oh crap, we have to go back and use that feature." <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but if they do, they're going to go buy it from Amazon. They're not yeah. going to go out and buy an imperva box and put it in front right. of their exactly. Amazon environment. Exactly. It's just not going to happen that way, right. right? I mean, that's that's the world we're starting to move to, and we are seeing some major trends in that space. You know. GE's announcement at reInvent last year to move all but four of their data centers to AWS has to like shock people mm -hmm. at, at a second, right? I mean, they're going to move like 30 data center work, 30 data centers, like 9,000 workloads to AWS, right? They're taking a footprint of 34 data centers down to four that they manage, right? If you're a traditional vendor, you're looking at that going, whoa. Yeah. I'm out. I, 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 I'm, Unless oh, I I'm smaller. I, I, I don't know that I'm out, out, but I am smaller than I was mm -hmm. before. And if you go overseas, and I do travel around the world, so I see these trends in different places. I mean, Australia is like all in cloud. I mean, everything they're doing is Docker containers in the cloud and cloud infrastructure services. All these new companies in Australia are all spinning up in AWS. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And so you're mm -hmm. definitely seeing regional pockets of this is happening. It, it's going to happen here. It's happening here. It's maybe a little slower than some of those markets. But, you know, when I go out and talk to customers, they all want to know, hey, how are you securing Docker containers? Because we're all deploying Docker in AWS. That is the tr that's the trend. In the growth rates that you're seeing, you're going to see Gartner just published their Q2 update on the on the public cloud stuff, right? Um, software as a service, platform as a service, which are all a, lot, a platform as a service, really the, these kind of services that uh, Amazon's spinning up, mm -hmm. Dynamo and on all these lambdas, Get your and database and exactly in the cloud, stuff, yeah. right? 19% um, CAGR, pretty good growth. Infrastructure as a service over the next two years is predicted 40 plus percent growth. Wow over the next two years, right? They are seeing an adoption of infrastructure as a service heavy in these next couple of years with close to 30% CAGRs after that. I mean, so there is definitely a shift at the infrastructure layer happening. Mm -hmm. But my concern with that 
is it doesn't seem like people, it's not necessarily making organizations more secure. Um, it goes back to kind of my earlier point. People assume that if they move to the cloud that all their security issues are going to be handled by Amazon or Azure or DigitalOcean. And it seems like we're embracing new mistakes. And that's my concern. I, I agree with you 100% as far as the growth. If, if, as a pen testing company, if I can't speak to cloud penetration testing and how we test those things, or more importantly, what things we absolutely cannot touch, um, people don't want to talk to us. They just don't. You have to be able to speak to those things. Yeah, and I think, and, the, so John, I'm with you on that point. I think the future is, is that those tools now need to get integrated into something higher to give that visibility back. And so it's not me deploying the hardware anymore. It's me consuming the data from the cloud providers, getting the analytics. I don't think AWS is going to build an analytics engine for security. Yeah. They're going to provide the base tools. I think somebody has to consume that data and be kind of that analytics layer that sits over top. Um, if we step out even further in my my thought process is this becomes a security governance problem, right? Somebody has to govern the cloud environment and all this other stuff. And so that data is going to get abstracted out. Somebody's going to sit there providing analytics across multiple cloud environments. I don't even know that companies just go to one. They're mm -hmm. going to have maybe two or three. They're going to have hybrid on-prem. So it's going to be this hybridized approach of where they're going to have to understand the controls they still support in their data centers where they have them. And they have to understand what's going on in their different cloud providers and bring all that data together. And I think that starts to really shape out the future of what a security governance kind of environment looks like. And it's, it's the guys that can pull all that data together that probably win at the end of the day. And that's why like, companies like Cloud Passage for me are so attractive to step into that space. No, I agree. Yeah, and Cloud Passage is already doing a lot of what Matt, if yep. not all of what Matt was talking about, right. um, which is fantastic. Um, just really quick, uh, Securonix and Thetapoint team up. Basically, a behavior analytics uh, company teams up with an MSSP. We're seeing this trend more and more as the technology companies get larger, they're focusing on product and spinning off professional services to MSPs or MSSPs. Also, Beyond Trust has launched an MSP program as well, in addition to Amazon Marketplace um, availability. So there's, they're shifting into the MSS, MSP space and they're shifting into the cloud space as well. The, for the first time, I believe their solutions are available in the cloud. Now, and Matt, I, admittedly, they're a little late to the party, but... <laughs> Matt, what do you think of Amazon Marketplace? Um, you see a lot of vendors, uh, like you can go and purchase their products and their services and their firewalls in Amazon Marketplace and implement it in your Amazon infrastructure. Do you see that as like a, a, like a way moving forward to have kind of vendor diversification? Or do you think it's more like a temporary thing? Like Amazon's like, yeah, 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 here's a marketplace. Just wait until we come up with products and offerings that absolutely crush everybody. Um, wh wh where is it? Or is it someplace in between? It depends. It, it does depend a little bit. I, I think Amazon will become a primary channel for security vendors through the marketplace, right? To make it really easy for customers or in AWS to spin up these security services. It depends on what the offering is in, in AWS marketplace, right? If it's a firewall, it doesn't make a lot of sense. If it's a agent, maybe it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? But tool products that will then consume data from AWS, right? Mm -hmm. That provide that analytics layer it's a great place for customers to go. Go to the marketplace. You know they're certified against Amazon. That's where you're running. If they've got all the hooks to all the data sources, it becomes a primary channel for how customers will probably buy some of this stuff mm -hmm. in the cloud in the future. Um, but MSPs in general, is a, I think that's a little disconnected. That's different, though, because I don't see Amazon turning themselves into an MSP, right? I think they become a channel for products that sit on top of their stuff to consume their data, to operate in, in, in people to buy. MSS, MSPs or MSSPs both provide a layer of resources that companies are struggling to get on the security side. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's probably a, a different um, issue. But we're gonna, I think we'll continue to see MSP and MSSP growth because it's harder and harder to go find all the resources to, right. to run their and own whether, sock or whatever. And whether whatever. you need security on premise or in the cloud or a hybrid of both, an MSP can help, I think, certainly the smaller players yeah. that don't have those large teams. Yeah, and you're seeing it, if you, if you look at the MSSP market and you look at where the highest growth is in the highest adoption rates, it's all Asia. 
Mm -hmm. And it's primarily because Asia can't get the resources to do it themselves. So they are much more open to outsourcing this stuff to service providers mm -hmm. to deliver um, some of these security aspects. I think part of this, though, is the MSSPs need to mature from where they are were mm -hmm. to where they need to go because if you look at where most of the mssp started it was well let me manage your firewalls and your ids's and etc right what we're talking about here is much more advanced security capabilities that are not just about managing firewalls and ids's anymore it's truly about trying to build security operation centers and doing analytics and responding to events that's an evolution of the mssp market and you're starting to see some of these mm -hmm. mssps go down that so you're starting to see them adopt some of this more cutting edge technology as part of their programs right well and, and the problem is i think i think you hit it on the head is the maturity is just not there yet um, you mentioned the Asian market. Almost all of our customers that are in the Asian market that are using MSSPs, they don't detect anything. And of course, that's the same thing for many MSSPs in the United States as well. The maturity just is not there, period. And I don't, I, I still can't understand this. This is something, you know, once again, we've talked about this before, is how can we have these industries spring up that by all intents and purposes are next to worthless, maybe 1% effective at detecting attacks, and yet people are just flocking to them. I, 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 it's something that I'm still trying to wrestle with in my head because there's only a handful of MSSPs that we actually trust to do a good job. Uh, binary Defense would be one of them. We know what they do, and they do a very, very good job at what they do. But they're also small, they're hungry, and they're trying to do something different. They have a small customer base. How does that actually scale to something the size of a Dell SecureWorks or a Verizon is a much larger and more painful question. Um, I, I just want to uh, close out the discussion at that point. So we can take a short break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about uh, Ian's article that he wrote not too long ago, uh, last month, the hottest security technology you didn't see in the black hat floor and some of our thoughts about his suggestions. Cool. Stay tuned.